Good morning, everybody. Paul here, coming at you with a Crypto Coffee update, where we will be talking about the news, events, conferences, etc., as they pertain to the uh, just exploding financial digital asset space known as crypto. And of course, I do have my coffee with me today, so please join me for that simultaneous sip where we turn the bottoms up in a caffeinated adventure. Mm. Good stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into what we have in front of us. First of which is the Cryptide website. Go check us out, cryptide.cc. And for those of you just joining us, a very, very brief tour. Video section, all of the crypto coffee vids. News section, all of the news we discuss in these videos, and even more, so you can have a little bite-sized, tantalizing piece of information as it pertains to the crypto space throughout your day. And we have in the blog section, Next Week's Crypto, which is an aggregation of all of the conferences and events happening in the wide world of crypto all around the planet, and perhaps even in your local area. So you could check those out if you so desire. And, of course, as said, Cryptide.cc, check us out whenever you have time. And moving on to your regularly scheduled programming, the nuclear crypto winter could potentially last another year or two. Ah, doomsday. And that's from Ledger CEO. Normally, we don't talk too much about other uh, in individuals' specific opinions just based on who they work for or where they're at. After all, that's a meritocracy out there. However, I found this particularly interesting given that it is already one of the longest bear markets that crypto has ever seen, and it seems to show no sign of slowing down, especially with the voracious hype we saw throughout 2017 and early 2018. Now, Ledger CEO, this is the cold storage wallet that I've praised in the past. Um, not financial advice, just personal opinion um, and seemingly cryptographically backed personal opinion that a cold storage wallet is much more secure than something that's a hot wallet or actively connected to the internet ready to use. I actually have here for your enjoyment today, let me move my head over here so you get a better idea, an unopened, this is one of my backup, Ledger Nano S's that I got from Ledger um, about a year and some change ago. You can see it is wrapped still in cellophane, nice, looks good. And I wanted to show this, and it's not even open, so I'm not going to pop it open here to show you, uh, again, one of my backups, what this would look like when you receive it from the Ledger uh, Corporation specifically. Now, there has been some dubious issues in the past where individuals buy from a third party one of these wallets. They open it up, it's wrapped up in a bag or something, and it has the area where you can write your 12 words filled in already. If you receive a cold storage wallet like that, do not use it. Put nothing on there. Return it to sender and report that individual because never, ever should those 12 words be filled in for you by the manufacturer. You will receive a piece of paper with 12 blank, just blank little circles where you can write in each individual word. And that is how you can recover the wallet. Let's say, you know, knock on wood, there's a house fire. This thing burns down. Ah, my crypto is gone. Well, if I have these 12 words backed up, stored in a like say security deposit box buried out in the yard, whatever, and it's still uh, obtainable, then I can get these funds back. However, it's fill if it's filled in for you, another individual has already done that and they can have access to your funds. So small little educational caveat there. Part of the reason I included this article, um, just due to interest in that, and that this could be a potentially quite long crypto winter. After all, it's cold out there, prices are low, and not too much action happening in terms of price action. There are some channel trades up and down, things like that. How However, uh, it's definitely not a winter for innovation. A lot of work has been being done, a lot of things being built out um, at Cryptide as well. A lot of things behind the scenes I'm getting excited to roll out for you guys here um, in Q1, Q2. But many people are dealing with this crypto winter in a variety of ways. Uh, one entity that is a smart contract auditing firm, they let go 80% of their staff. We're talking about Hosho, which means security in Japanese, and they enjoyed a um, huge amount, just absolutely voracious interest in auditing smart contracts throughout the 2017 and early 2018 bull run. Every individual under the sun needed some form of uh, verifiability that the smart contracts that they were issuing were indeed uh, in integrous, integritous. Uh, they held up under scrutiny essentially and did what people said that they would do. However, uh, there's not necessarily um, always good actors. There's always good and bad actors in any space, but when you're dealing with financial technology, especially still tepidly regulated financial technology, sometimes completely unregulated, you're going to get some bad actors. 
Um, and somewhere around here, uh, yeah, here the level of immaturity in the space in the first half of 2018 was very, very high. Um, he saw some teams clearly cut and pasted from other teams' smart contracts without changing anything, and that they were told very scammy things. Uh, and that's definitely not the kind of people you want in crypto per se. Obviously, they're in it to make a quick buck and not actually do any technical innovation within their circle of competence. Um, however, this this company specifically and this individual, uh, they did not take any of this payment. So cheers to Hosho. Cheers Cheers to the team for having that level of integrity um, and being transparent and forthright about that. Laying off 80% of your staff is never an easy thing to do, very painful, especially as you get to know these individuals. Um, however, if the money's not there and really the top priority, as you can see here, is to stay alive, then this is sometimes a necessary evil that occurs in business. And after all, if they are able to survive as an entity, work hard, expand the scope of their services and quality of service despite the drawdown in actual staff, that is going to uh, serve as a mark of honor and a mark of integrity on their company that, who knows, when the next bull run kicks off, they can very well well make a powerful name for themselves in the space. So best of luck to Hosho, best of luck to the individuals who indeed unfortunately were laid off. Um, but with a skill set like that, you know, I have no doubt you guys will do great out there in the space. Now, some individuals are taking a less above the board route, uh, especially compared to um, denying um, funds. It's like, hey, you know, verify this contract and you know, some under the table payment, even though it doesn't do what we say it does, you know, come on, help me out. You know, Hosho, huge amount of integrity. This guy, not so much. He was swapping SIM cards and ended up stealing over $5 million worth of cryptocurrency. Now, this guy, you know, wet behind the ears, 20 years old, he's a hacker, uh, maybe he got himself a big head, but that's one thing that does not serve as a good excuse in court. This individual will be um, accepting a plea deal, so it could have been much higher if he would have fought the uh, government, assumingly, and will be receiving 10 years in prison. This amounts to currently half of this guy's life, so it's got to be... Um, really, really jarring and intense for this guy. Uh, definitely um, not the best situation here. I mean, this guy maybe didn't understand the full scope of his actions, but he's a grown adult. So if you're going to do the crime, you got to be ready to do the time. Um, and this is not something that should be endorsed. Um, but nonetheless, you can't help but to some degree, at least, especially with human empathy, feel a little rough for somebody who's like, oh man, you know, it's maybe he was tempted to that degree where he would do something like this. But this is again, why integrity and verifiability is so important. Uh, you got to have individual integrity, you got to try and stand by what you know, uh, what was it Marcus Aurelius? Always know what you say, but do not always say what you know. So, uh, definitely thumbs down to this guy. But you know, hopefully within a decade he'll learn his lesson and maybe be able to put those skills to use in a more above board, positive way. But you know, people are dealing with this uh, bear market in many, many different ways. And one way that some individuals may be able to increase their holdings is by taking on debt during this bear market. Maybe not the best idea. Again, here at Cryptide, we try to advocate as hard as we can for individual responsibility. Only you know what's best for you. However, a crypto credit card being offered through a cryptocurrency exchange may have potentially some um, implications, for instance, like why are you going to get a credit card from a crypto exchange? Do you not have good enough credit to get it elsewhere? There's a lot of details that go into this, and that's not obviously the case for all users. Uh, the balance of credit and debt is a very, very um, tricky situation for some. However, if leveraged correctly, it can be an extremely powerful tool to not only stave off corporate hostile takeovers, but to allow individuals to prove that they have the financial capacity to handle these kinds of financial instruments and therefore be extended greater leverage and levels of credit by which they can leverage this credit to increase the overall economic capacity of not only themselves, but the society as a whole. After all, if they have the skill of prescience in which they can use for investment, then they're probably going to keep with that trend more often than not, thereby coming out in the positive. However, that's not for everybody, and buying extremely speculative assets such as this on credit can be a huge detriment. There have been some horror stories of individuals back in 2017, 2018, who decided, man, we're going to the moon, we've already hit 15K, I'm going to mortgage my house, I got this. Well, now we're sitting at $3,000 and the house is figuratively underwater. So that's not a not a great situation to be in. So really, you can read the details here for yourself. There's a lot of information into um, not only who bought crypto and how much and when. That's the big question, isn't it? How much and when? Uh, but also some information about the card itself. 
really the big takeaway here was to do your own research, of course, as always, but also be careful of some of these more um, volatile financial in instruments, especially when related to volatile emerging digital financial assets, because you never know which way the wind may blow. And if that can affect your long term financial situation, well, sometimes it's best to sit back and wait. And again, not always know what you're saying, but oh, wait, always know what you say, but don't always say what you know. And sometimes hold off and let's wait and see. Now, this is definitely something that isn't going to last forever. Fidelity, we talked about them a few Crypto Coffee updates ago. They are launching a platform for custodial services that is now entering its final testing phase. Uh, that's right, folks. We talked about this previously, and now it's coming to fruition. And it's funny that Fidelity was able to leapfrog over Backed. Everyone was so stoked about Backed. Man, these Bitcoin futures that are going to be settled in actual Bitcoin on-chain. Well, it seems custodial services may well be more relevant uh, than futures contracts for the time being, especially uh, considering considering the downturn in the markets, and this could really kick off potentially a new bull run. Not immediately now. Again, could it be a year or two, or maybe it could be six months? I don't know. You guys tell me what you think below in the comments or over on the Discord. One thing is for sure, though, having this kind of custodial service will protect larger institutional investors from having to usurp a level of technical expertise that otherwise could result in a major loss of funds. So this is exciting. This is from the initial clients who are being a huge, huge part of the process over at Fidelity, helping to kind of test out the platform in a kind of a... I guess, tenuous way, seeing how things shape up and fixing things as they go. However, they are almost ready for prime time, according to a blog post from Fidelity themselves. Now, speaking about uh, institutional investment, this individual, and this is just from a Twitter thread, really. Where do they put it? Oh, they, yeah, this is the one. They broke it down really nicely, actually. Uh, there's a couple groups of uh, crypto... I guess you can call them enthusiasts, just institutional individuals who are both familiar with and interested in crypto that have not made the jump into the space in any serious capacity. Maybe they played around and bought a few Bitcoin themselves on their own dime, but they haven't really put the full weight of their portfolio behind allocating a reasonable amount to these emerging digital assets. And this individual breaks them down into three different groups. You have the beginning investors, um, then you have the traditional hedge fund due diligence investor, and then the savvy crypto investor. And we're not going to go too much into crazy detail. I guess we could because we have a little bit of time. Um, but I want to kind of entertain a different subject here a bit later in the video. Um, but really, it talks about how these large institutional potential investors view the crypto space very disparately. And while there is some overlap between the um, three established camps, if you will, as to how they view these digital assets, uh, there are some discrepancies that can lead to very large actualized differentiations as to, as to how they interact with the space. So so for instance, many of them are still in the wait and see phase. However, some of them are looking for statistical data that demonstrably proves that this could be a hedge to fiat. Others are waiting for regulatory approval, most are, to assure that this is ironclad and there's no issue and that it can serve as more of a long-term new digital gold. So digital gold versus correlation to the dollar uh, there's going to be some correlation maybe, but there could be some differentiation therein. Um, so, and then you have the new, uh, basically, viewpoint that crypto is cash, um, pr as per the Bitcoin white paper. And if that's going to be the case, that's going to have a much uh, different implication than if Bitcoin is digital gold or if it's a hedge against uh, fiat or something like that. So these camps do have similarities and they do have a substantial amount of differences as well. But as said, that doesn't mean that interest is going away. These individuals are very much doing uh, what we mentioned when we talked about these Binance credit cards, they're waiting and seeing because they don't want to rush into any decision that may in turn cause them to actualize a major loss due to overextending their technical knowledge. And that's something that Andreas um, Antonopoulos specifically said when he was talking to Trace Myers. Um, actually, is elucid elucidated Trace Meyer's statement. Um, a lot of these, t a lot of these situations where individuals lose Bitcoin, it is a user's lack of technical expertise rather than an actual hack itself. And this is something I can't stress enough, and why many of these highly intelligent, prescient, and wealthy individuals are just simply waiting and seeing with the majority of their portfolios. "Quote: Not because it is stolen, but because your ambition for technical excellence exceeds your current skill level, and you messed up on this execution." This applies to every level of technical expertise. So don't think we're talking down to anybody here. This is what I love about Andreas. He's so uh, generally open-minded and, and willing to absorb critically information as it pertains to the space. 
really a powerful individual in that regard. Uh, there's always a higher level of security to achieve by adding a bit more complexity. Security is not an on or off switch. It is a, such as a, is this secure or insecure? Um, we've mentioned this before on this channel. Security is very much a spectrum. Uh, things can be an open door. You can just waltz right in, no problem. Much like accessing these websites, you just simply send a request and in you go. Or it can be ironclad and you're quantumly secure by which you have to have a specific type of information uh, by which you, you uh, can utilize to enter into that ecosystem. And that comes with all of the implications that you may imagine, such as down to the binary level um, of computing as to how these systems may be exploited. So again, it's a huge spectrum as to how technically secure something is and how technically insecure something may be. Whatever else the risk model might include, continues Andreas, then you must balance that against your technical skills. Find which of these risks you can eliminate in a way that you and anyone designated to help your loved ones. Um, recover your crypto if something happens to you can execute flawlessly. Uh, this is the sweet spot. So essentially, having a level of security that protects you from a hack, but being able to recover your coins in the event of some kind of issue or tragedy is paramount. After all, we mentioned an example, knock on wood, of a house fire earlier in which this fine piece of equipment was destroyed. Whoosh. So if that were to happen and you have these 12 phrases buried somewhere where only you or a very close loved one knows or in a bank security deposit box in an envelope um, after all most people aren't going to know what these 12 words mean and there's many legal implications as to accessing these things tendentially that is a level of security that is very much uh, stomachable and reasonable for your average user after all again you have legal implications for taking something out of a security deposit box if it's not yours so you have a paper trail there it's not like these funds were hacked um, and sent to some mysterious address or you know they just happen to be locked in a cold storage wallet because the co-founder died of Crohn's in India I know that's really specific and here's why <laughs> um so this is the main meat of the matter that I wanted to discuss today. It is really interesting. We're going to go down a rabbit hole, um, and we've discussed this previously. Quadrica CX uh, owes their customers $190 million. Why? Because apparently the founder of the exchange died in India of complications via Crohn's disease. A huge tragedy. Um, definitely, you know, death is one of those subjects where it's, you know, when the reaper comes knocking, it's your time. And we, it's one of the commonalities we all experience. Everyone gets a six foot box in the end, no matter if you're a billionaire or if you're a poor man on the street. However, what's strange is whether or not that six foot box is actually filled with you or not. So like I said, we're going to get into some interesting stuff today. Now, Emin Gunserer is a, um, a cryptographer, I suppose you can call him that, computer scientist, and a brilliant mind over at Cornell. He says that this sounds a little fishy, and I have to agree after looking at a lot of the information. Uh, some individuals like Crypto Medication and CER, uh, they're digging into this subject as well. I plugged Crypto Medication last time. We talked about Crypto Exchange Ranks, um, which is a subsidiary of Hacken, another uh, crypto project that seeks to do transparency hacking. They're on the case, and they found some interesting stuff. Let's take a look at what Emir is saying, or Emin, excuse me. Emin is saying, looks like the CEO who died of Crohn's in India even thought of what to do with his chihuahuas, but didn't have a plan for the cold wallet for the exchange. Now, a cold wallet essentially works like this. You log on to an exchange, you send in your funds, and you have normally what's called a pre-hot wallet for the exchange. This says, hey, a user's depositing funds. We need to give them the, ref basically reflect that balance. So if you send a Bitcoin, the exchange says, yo, this guy has a Bitcoin on the exchange. That then goes to the exchange's hot wallet, step two. The hot wallet helps to settle balances on the exchange um, as things are happening live. Then you have normally what's called a pre-cold wallet, which is a wallet that serves to not necessarily interact with the internet itself and the exchange, but rather with only the hot wallet. Then you have a multiplicity of cold wallets. These cold wallets, not connected to the internet, just kind of hanging out, doing their thing, and they are the bulk of a cryptocurrency exchange's holdings. This is so that if the actual exchange itself gets hacked, then you don't lose a huge amount of your funds and end up with a um, one day you're fine and then another day due to a hack, you are insolvent. That is not what we want to see, and that's, that's normally why these processes are laid out as such. And this is what CoinCheck from Japan, that's what they didn't do, and that's why they had $530 million worth of NEM stolen. Okay, so let's turn that problem with CoinCheck on its head. Now we have $190 million locked in a cold wallet that nobody can get to. So there's an old joke in crypto, it's like, hey, I got great news, your funds are totally safe. Okay, that's, that's great, what's the bad news? Well, no one can access them, right? Yeah, not even you.
So <laughs> extra secure, but this is just fishy. So this guy had everything laid out with his chihuahuas, but didn't have a plan for his exchange's cold wallet. Someone will end up monitoring this wife's communication because he does have a, a an alleged widower now, his wife, um, just to see if she's talking to a mysterious guy in India. Of course, and this is something that, that I really want to drive home because I've kind of chuckled at some of this stuff because it's, it's just so really bizarre in a way. Um, but just to, to really bring this back down to, to a human level, of course, there's a chance that this individual has genuinely passed away, in which case doubting an untimely death in India will look retrospectively very bad and disrespectful. However, death should be peaceful and private and ultimately a solitary event as a min goes on. Owning crypto and possessing other people's coins make it, makes it the opposite of that. If you are a custodian of someone's capital and you are the sole uh, essentially proprietor of ensuring that uh, things are executing properly and then you plain old up and die, no one is there to usurp that responsibility it still falls on you, despite you being, you know, uh, what is it, post-mortem. So, nonetheless, let's look at the facts at hand. Um, it's interesting that two other, qua uh, it's so hard to say, Quadriga, Quadriga founders look like they are fake names, and one of them's an anagram for heroin lover. Um, that's not definitive or empirical per se as to whether or not that's a real name or fake name. However, it doesn't look like that's their actual names per se, and there's no way to verify their, ide their identity. So that's a big, giant red flag right there. Uh, not only that, the cold wallets are definitely not cold at all, and it seems as though that previously, not only did they claim that these were multi-signature wallets by which, in the event of the untimely death of one of the users, of the, uh, not users, the owners of the exchange, they could go ahead and get these crypto out of the cold storage wallet. Now it seems that's not the case. And not only that, uh, Litecoin is being actively moved out of the wallet. Where'd it go? Oh man. Hang on. I mean, I wish I had the old 1950s. We are now experiencing technical difficulties. Essentially, and it might have been deleted in the time of uh, from now to recording. It seems as though Litecoin was being actively moved out of this cold storage wallet as things were happening. I'll try and circle back and get that information for you um, and share that below in the description. But again, things are happening and evolving so quickly. Things are tenuous. We're not exactly sure what's happening. Uh, but it does indeed look like things are looking very, very fishy. Uh, two out of three of the founders, one of which is allegedly dead, don't have any identities that can be corroborated. The one that can be corroborated is allegedly dead in India. We haven't seen any specific information to build up that story. Um, so yeah, everything is in limbo for the moment, despite the fact that this founder owes his customers $190 million. So yeah, we'll keep you updated on this as things unfold. Very, very interesting times we're living in. And again, this helps to highlight why custodial accounts are so important and why it's so important to ensure that just like these exchanges, you have some kind of hot wallet, cold wallet thing in place where you're only keeping the amount of money you want to trade with, only the amount of coins you want to actively interact with on any exchange and keep the bulk of your crypto that you're not using to trade on a secure device or in a secure wallet in a secure method that you are best comfortable with that of course you're going to arrive at this decision by doing your own research and i really hope we can help to empower you with some of the tools and information that can help you go along this journey doing your own research and make it as easy as possible to come to your own conclusions if you ever have any extra questions let me know in the comments or hop in the discord as as i've said before we are extremely reachable and if you want to send an email cryptide at cryptide.cc simple as that or for me paul at cryptide.cc so hit me up all right let's go ahead and get in some interesting things we've talked about before make sure these guys aren't here jump on my back or anything and talk about eos i know last time i did that i was just swarmed by a mob of people i think there was like a collective um coordinated downvote of my videos um there's a guy who was responding with all of his own videos basically refuting these claims i don't i really didn't have time for that I, i've got a lot on my plate um but i found this interesting because this helps to corroborate a bit about what we talked about before in the video um the issue of creeping centralization in the eos architecture something that definitely has been a problem since the outset and is seemingly still occurring essentially only 1.6 of all stakeholders own 90% of the token distribution. Um, Pareto principle, while it's a little greater than the Pareto principle, um, which is uh, should be about 20% of users holding 80% of the supply, um, definitely a bit more concentrated than that, but that's neither here nor there. It's still an early ecosystem. The issue with this comes in to play mostly when you consider the voting capacity of the EOS chain. You have to have 15% uh, participation for anything to be considered valid, and you have to have a vote as to whether it passes or fails. So with minnows, which are just smaller accounts that hold more retail uh, balances, they control only 10% of the total distribution. So nothing can 
can pass unless you have that 15% participation, as said before. So reasonably, it seems as though these block producers or these large whales, they're not actually voting in any of the referendums per se. They're mostly just voting in one another as block producers. This is something we tried to drive home in the EOS uh, videos that we put out, talking about how it becomes more profitable at a particular point. There's no objective point here. It depends on all the variables in the system to cooperate and collude rather than compete. And without that sense of healthy competition, ultimately it's a race to the bottom in terms of wealth concentration in an ecosystem, especially when you have voting at play. And this individual outlines some possible explanations. Either the whales don't care, they actually don't want this or any other referendums to pass for whatever reason, or they have plans for all that EOS in the inflation naming and RAM fee accounts and it doesn't involve minnow stakeholders, or maybe a mix of all of the above. Um, why haven't the whales blatantly created a referendum to feather their bed even further yet? Uh, and again, this has received some pretty nice upvotes. It's nice to see the EOS community uh, just going for that transparency. So shout out to them. I, I know a lot of users on the EOS network who are just fine folk. They're just interested in this project. They want to see it succeed. And I don't, I don't think anybody wants to see a $4 billion project crash and burn. That's a huge loss of effort, a huge loss of wealth, and a huge, huge loss of human innovation and time um, and just applied coding, essentially. A lot of, a lot of work down the drain if that does fail um, and who's to say this could easily be a system that doesn't fail and succeeds especially with the plethora of backing however um, no amount of cash money would have saved the titanic from cracking in half and sinking and if this is indeed an issue of creeping centralization if not mitigated in a reasonable time frame then indeed the rapid decay of such a system due to the lack of efficacy that users have in said system is something that is going to become increasingly difficult to solve so again um, not trying to uh, dissuade anybody from checking out these sorts of things and these sorts of projects, but it definitely looks as though the hierarchical incentive structure in EOS leaves much to be desired and perhaps much collusion open to, uh, to be had, especially among block producers. So again, share this below in the description so you too can access all of this lovely primary sourced information. And now I want to pivot, quick pivot, to this nice chart. I love this chart. I can't quite tell everything that's going on. However, I can because I have wise counsel. These are just some sneak peeks I wanted to show you because the last chart that was posted over on the one and only Origami Oracle, his Twitter was on January 30th, and this is from just a few hours ago, I believe about five or six hours ago. So this gives you perhaps an idea as to where the Bitcoin price may potentially go. Again, not financial advice, just speculation and the applied um, the applied field of technical analysis. I just wanted to give Origami Oracle another shout out. He is our resident technical analyst over at Cryptide. Dude does such a great job. I mean, really, I see some TA people really just hyping their stuff like, oh, this thread will blow your mind. It's the biggest thread you've ever seen on crypto Twitter. Trust me. And then they go and they analyze some stuff about volume. And it's really not all that impressive. And I don't know, maybe they're young, maybe they're new, or maybe they're just trying to hype their own name. After all, self-interest. That's not what happens with Origami Oracle. This dude lays out the facts, lays out his opinion, lets time play it out, and is always 100% transparent with his calls. And I'm not saying that because he's the head TA guy over at Cryptide. I'm saying because of that, that's why he's the head TA guy over at Cryptide. Because again, it goes back to integrity. Individual integrity means everything in this space. It is a trustless system. However, in terms of interpersonal relationships, there's always going to be some level of trust. So again, with that transparency comes the phrase, trust but verify. Really great stuff. All right, that's all we have on the agenda for today. Let me know what you think of this kind of content below in the comments and of course sources below in the description and join us over on the Discord. Of course, links below in the description for that as well. Would always love to have some great conversation with you guys. Always great minds, um, kind of bumping heads and sharing thoughts and that's how you really get the best um, distillation of information here and in any space really. So thanks so much for watching guys. My name is Paul, we are Cryptide and remember the tide is rising as is this chart, so, hmm.